we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we praise Him. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be praised, we thank Allah for keeping us alive for another blessed month, the month of Muharram. Yani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave this month a title. This title is very big, very glorious, very um, overwhelming. Allah, the Prophet ﷺ called this Shahrullah al Haram, or simply Shahrullah. This is the month of Allah, or the month of Allah, the sacred month of Allah. And as I have the intention, inshallah, to cover a few components, and maybe together they will make a big picture. One of the components is to understand this word of haram, plural of haram, or a shahrul haram. Is this word haram, we all know, pretty simply means forbidden. This is haram, forbidden. But then you have Baytullah al Haram, the house of Allah, the forbidden house of Allah. And then we have Shahrullah al Haram, the forbidden month of Allah. So, obviously, if you want to go simple logic, if you say Baytullah al Haram, the forbidden house of Allah, forbidden what? We are not supposed to visit it? Because when something is haram, we're not supposed to do it. So, if Baytullah al Haram is it the forbidden house, which means no one shall visit? The month of Allah, Al-Haram, which is the month of Muharram, does that mean we're not supposed to visit, to live it? Al-Ashhur Al-Haram, the four sacred months, are we supposed to not witness it? What, what does it mean here? What it means is something that is very relevant for our life today, today, in this world, 2017, in the Western world where we Muslims make small communities and we have our faith, our religion, our tradition. We have our values, we have our principles. Um, we have um, our defined structures of halal and haram. Some people do not think that observing Haram, meaning staying away from haram, it's not a big deal. They take it easy when it comes to haram. But Islam, our deen, Islam, the word Islam, and our deen is established on halal and haram. Let me explain a little bit. What do I mean by that? People translate the word Islam to peace. I humbly disagree. If you were to translate the word Islam, which we mean the deen of Islam, you need a whole sentence. This sentence is driven from three, four ayat. What is the sentence? Islam is, or means, to live in the state of safety. That's number one. Aspiring to peace. That's number two. By making an informed choice, number three, to submit your will to the will of Allah, number four. Now you have a complete definition. To live in the state of safety, aspiring to peace. By making an informed choice, what's the choice? To submit your will to the will of Allah. Now you have accomplished every ayah that is, explains Islam in al quran From the beginning of the creation, when there was only one human being, Adam, and then Allah Azza wa created Hawa. So we have now a pair from the same kind. Adam and his wife. Allah said to Adam and his wife, go and live in Jannah. Go and live in this garden. And eat from wherever you want to eat. But do not eat from this tree. Do not eat from this tree. 
This is the first story of the first human mentioned in the Quran. First story, Allah created Adam. Allah taught Adam the name of all the things. Taught Adam the name of all the things. Asked the angels to make sajda to Adam, which is a big deal. Because Allah, Allah is asking the angels to make sajda to Adam. Whoa! Everything you know is flipped upside down right now. Because you will be thinking, oh, I wish I was an angel. You know, sujood to anyone other than Allah is shirk in our deen. Yes, in this final message that Allah sent to humanity, don't, um, don't make sujood to anyone other than Allah. Unless Allah commands you to do something else. So in this case, Allah commanded the angels to make sujood to Adam. Allah mentioned two reasons in the Quran. Why did he ask the angels to make sujood to Adam? Because Adam has two things. What are these two things? These two things are embedded in the ayat that Allah says, I asked the angels to make sujood to Adam. One time Allah said that after he said, I taught Adam the names of all the things. Because Adam had the knowledge, then Allah asked angels to bow to Adam who holds this knowledge. Number one. Another ayah, it says, after Allah blew the spirit in Adam, then Allah asked the angels to make sujood to Adam. So two reasons, your soul and your knowledge. The most two neglected things by you. What is the most taken care of things by you? Your looks and your money. Let's be real, right? We want to benefit here. We don't want to just lie to you when I talk and you, oh, nice talk and this. We have to bother each other for us to grow. Pain and pressure leads to growth. So we're not going to run away from pain because as we said, humanity found out no pain. Oh, so let's not run away from pain. Let's deal with it. Not run away from it so that we can grow. Two things. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي خَالِقٌ بَشَرًا مِنْ طِينٍ Your Lord said to the angels, I'm going to create a human from mud, mixed water and dirt. Still there is no command for to sujood. Still. So Allah continues. فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ Once I'm done creating him and I'm done shaping him, وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مَنْ رُوحِي And then I blow in him of my spirit, then fall into sujood to him. So, teen, taswiya, nafkh ruh fall into sujood. So in this ayah, Allah asked the angels to make sajda to Adam because of the ruh. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah said, I'm going to create khalifa. Yani you are a khalifa, and 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 you are, everyone is khalifa. Not in the political sense, the word khalifa in the political sense is not mentioned in the the word Khalifa, that you represent God and you are his servant, is everyone. That's what's mentioned in the Quran, which is everyone in this room and everyone on this planet. Whether they choose to become a Khalifa or not, that's their choice. So Allah said, I'm going to create a Khalifa. The angels said, Ya Allah, why would you create people that will fight each other and kill each other? So Allah said, I know what you don't know. Then Allah immediately said, I taught Adam the names of all the things. Then I showed them to the angels and said, tell me of these names. They said, Ya Allah, we don't know. Because we only know what you taught us and you didn't teach us this. So, Ya Allah, we don't know. You are the most wise, the most knowledgeable. We submit to you. Allah said, Adam, tell them the names. Tell, tell them. Tell them the names. So, Adam told them the names. After Adam was done displaying the knowledge that he has and he has learned from Allah, then Allah said, Angels, make now sujood to Adam. So, two reasons in the Quran your soul and your knowledge. This is a month of purification. We purify our souls with making tawbah, with making istighfar, not with being arrogant. How do people talk to today? This is the way I am. Take it or leave it. I like doing this this way. Okay. So you are your own religion and you are your own God and you are your own way and you are your own system because let's deal. We need to know what we're dealing with. This is the way I am. I don't do the... I don't, this is arrogance. Okay. Arrogance in talk. Allah will send one mosquito and then you will not talk like that. 
when you start boiling in malaria, mm -hmm. that one mosquito that you said, you know, if someone called you, you know, you're nobody, a mosquito could kill you. How could you say that to me? Right? Forget an external threat. As I said today, every day, every day, on average, between 10 to 100, maybe more, cells in your body mutate and become cancerous cells, and your immune system goes and finds them and kills them. One time the body misses one cell, it will grow out of control, and that person has cancer. So forget external threat, your own body cells. And you're talking, ah, this is the way I am, this is the way I like it, this is the way I do things. And in five minutes, you go to the, later, you go to the bathroom, and the smell that comes out of the bathroom is toxic, poisonous. You can't even stand your own smell. And where was that smell? And where was that feces? Inside you. But Allah hid it, that you don't smell it, nobody else will smell it. And why these feces and this smell inside you, you're talking la 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 with arrogance. So that's why we have two choices, to be like Adam or to be like Shaitan. Allah told Adam, Ya Adam, everything is halal except this one item is haram. If you eat it, it will harm you. Shaitan will try to make you eat it though. So Adam السلام, lived in Jannah, God knows how he long he lived. And after he lived in Jannah for a long time, he didn't touch the tree. After time passed and passed and passed, Adam forgot. This is not me, Allah said in the Quran. وَآدَمُ مِنْ قَبْلِ إِذْ نَسِيَ وَلَمْ نَجِدْ لَهُ عَزْمًا Allah even defended Adam in the Quran. Adam, the one who disobeyed Allah and ate from the tree, who's a prophet, <coughs> the best prophet, the Prophet ﷺ said, he ate from the tree, but Allah said, he ate because he forgot. He did not do it intentionally. Allah defended Adam in the Quran. Why? Because Adam made tawbah. So do you want Allah to defend you? Make tawbah. Don't be arrogant in your disobedience. You make a disobedience, then you are arrogant about it. Then you are saying, oh, I did it, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> yeah, achi, you made a mistake, a sin, repent. Because when Adam repented, you know, Adam السلام, and his wife, they had a so broken heart when they realized shaitan misled them to eat from that tree and they forgot the command of Allah. They were just heartbroken. They didn't even know what to say. They just showed Allah that their heart broken. But they didn't know what to say. So do you know what Allah said in the Quran? When I saw Adam going through that, I taught Adam a dua. He made dua to me, I answered it and forgave him. Yani exam with cheating. <laughs> you to, this is your exam. What's your exam? Don't eat from the tree. Oh, Allah, I ate from the tree, I'm very sorry. Okay. Just say this. say this. Okay, Adam said it. Why are you forget? Nothing happened. And that's how easy our religion is. People want to make it hard and difficult, or people want to change it and not abide by it. You don't want it? There's a different choice. Allah gave space for everyone. You want it? It's easy. Just abide by it to the best of your knowledge. Listen, listen. Why did Allah Azza wa Tell him don't eat from the tree because there was harm to Adam. There was harm to Adam in that tree. Do you know interestingly when the story is told by the Christians, not by Christians, actually by the Bible, the story says that God did not want Adam to eat from this tree because it's the tree of knowledge. And Adam, God did not want Adam to know. Do you know what's the story in the Quran? Before Adam entered Jannah, he already knows Allah taught him all the knowledge, he's done learning the knowledge, and Malaika made sujood to him, and now he's honored by living in Jannah. The story on the other side says what? He told him not because God did not want Adam to. And when Adam ate from that the thing, he came to know. <coughs> and then he started, you know, questioning and saying, God, you know, and then Adam and Eve heard the footsteps of God walking in the garden. I'm quoting for you word for word. And then they hid behind the tree. And then God said, Adam, where are you? Where are you hiding? He said, here I am hiding behind the tree. 
and I'm hiding from you because I'm naked and I am embarrassed. He said, how did you know that you were naked? How did you come to have knowledge? Did you eat from the tree? He said, yes, I ate from the tree. He said, why did you eat from the tree? Didn't I tell you not to eat from the tree? He said, it's not me. It's that woman that you put with me. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Pull Genesis, number one. And then our Muslim sisters are sold that Islam is to degrade women and the Quran degrades women and this and that. You don't need to go far in any other book. I mean, before you attack us Muslims and attack our book, Read your book first, so that you have some adab and you are not attacking with long horns, right? Because your horns will disappear once you read the first two pages. You will have no horns to fight with. He said, it is that woman that you put for me. She made me eat from the tree. So God says, why did you eat from the tree? Oh, it's that devil. The devil took a snake, the shape of a serpent, and the serpent told me. So God said, no, you, 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 I, you, you, you're punished, and your punishment will be that you're going to go through pain when you carry the baby, and pain when you deliver the baby, but you shall still desire your husband. And in astaghfirullah al other way, I'm going to make you a psycho. You're going to go through pain, and then you're going to desire the pain. You understand? And then, in the Quran, the pain that the woman goes through in pregnancy and delivery, Allah praised it in the Quran, called it jihad. And made us, Allah tells us, if only, if only, just remember. Just remember that your mother carried you in weakness upon weakness. A man came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, my mother was a slave. I first freed myself, then I have freed my mother. Have I paid her back? And the Prophet looked at him and smiled. He said, not even for one of her contractions. You haven't paid her back, not even for one of her contractions. Contractions in Quran and Sunnah are praised as honor. Somewhere else is punishment for women. And then God said to the serpent, I'm going to make an animosity between you and the children of Adam. If you, they shall step on your head and you shall bite them in their heels. The shaitan is not the serpent. What's the problem of the serpent, you know? Any case. From the beginning of humanity, Allah defined us human beings as what makes you a human, what makes you an honorable of creation of Allah. You have a mind, you have knowledge, and then you have an honor. You have a dignity, you have integrity, and there are certain things that you shall not do. There is a red line. You shall not do, you shall not cross. Why? Because you are a human. Because you have a mind. Because you have emotions. Because you have senses. Because you understand. Because Allah speaks to you and you understand the revelation. You shall have limits. I'm going to ask you a question. What do you call a person without limits who can do anything, anytime, anywhere? What do you call them? Huh? Shameless? Thank you. Another word? Daredevil. Daredevil is the one who performs dangerous acts. But what I'm saying, what do you call someone who's willing to do anything? There's no limits, no forbidden. Anything, anywhere, anywhere. Heedless. Huh? Heedless. Okay, more? Desperate. Desperate. <coughs> Ignorant. You're very nice. <laughs> Rebellious, rebellious, animal, animal, animal. Rebellious. Yeah, well, animals are nice. Animals are nice. Rebellious. A pride of lions. Pride of lions. They go hunting after buffaloes. How many buffaloes do they catch? One. one. Twenty-five lions eat one. Do you know what does the human do? One machine gun. One human kills twenty-five human beings. Not to eat, not for survival, just because of anger. Lions don't do that. Tigers don't do that. Hyenas don't do that. They just kill and to eat. And once they are done, they show you on nature videos, deers and gazelles know when the lion has eaten from the way he lays down. They walk right in front of him. He's not going to attack. He already ate. They know. They're not afraid of him. The second day you see him sits down like this, okay, don't mess with him, he's hungry, time to run, right? <laughs> That's exactly. So a lion, haram, a lion is not a criminal. 
A lion does not turn around and kill 25 lions because he's angry. Angry. You understand? So, when you do some, when you have no limits, you know, so, would you become a friend of someone who has no limits? Would you become a friend of someone who can turn against you and do anything because there's nothing forbidden to him? He can do anything, whatever he feels like he does, right? So that's why when a person has no limits, that person is like, there's no even word to describe. It becomes inhuman, not even, doesn't even belong to the animal kingdom. What happens when a person has limits, will never cross the limits, and you can predict his limits, like he's predicted. He will not lie to you, he will not steal from you, he will not kill you, he will not backbite you. What do you call such a person? Huh? Honorable. Huh? What do you call such a person? Huh? Trustworthy. Huh? Mm -hmm. High character, right? That's why when a person has limits versus a person who has no limits, that person is what we call a godly person, holy person, righteous person, because he has limits and he doesn't cross. She doesn't cross this, that limit. So all of a sudden, throughout different languages, Throughout history and throughout space, today, today, the word forbidden in every language is used in two contexts. Forbidden, don't do, and forbidden means holy and sacred. Even Buddhists, they have their forbidden city. The Vatican used to be called the forbidden city. I mean, this city is holy and nobody does anything harmful in it. So, when a person has haram, which means limit, that person is a holy person. And then for him, there is a holy city to visit, al baytul haram And for him, there is a holy month, in which he's double holy, he's double, yani he has double forbidden things, because he has limits. This is very, very important, because today, freedom means you have no limits. You just do whatever you feel like. No, 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 that's not freedom, that's inhumanity. That's, that's in, there is no dignity, indignity, right? That, that's, 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 that means that human becomes very dangerous. And that's why we have no problem so on pressing a button and wiping a whole nation. Making a decision and destroying a whole nation. Why? Because there's no limits. There's no harm. And usually, People who don't adhere to haram, they almost have zero, small to none believe in the Day of Judgment. Because it's all built on each other. If you don't believe that you will be questioned for what you do, you can do whatever you want. So believing on the Day of Judgment creates in you, inside you, a policeman inside you. Who's watching you from inside you, because you believe there is a day of judgment, and therefore, I better not mess with anything. Not destroy myself, not destroy others, in the name of me wanting to do whatever I want to do. So when Allah Azza wa Jal, in Al-Quran Al-Kareem, in Surah Al-Tawbah, made a statement that, you know, I will read for you the ayah from Surah Tawbah, Surah number 9 and ayah number 36, so that we are taking directly from the original source, the Book of Allah. <laughs> إن عدة الشهور عند الله اثنا عشر شهرا اثنا عشر شهرا في كتاب الله يوم خلق السماوات والأرض منها أربعة حرم 
ذلك الدين القيم فلا تظلموا فيهن أنفسكم وقاتلوا المشركين كافة كما يقاتلونكم كافة واعلموا أن the number of months in the sight of Allah are 12 months. In the book of Allah, in the record of Allah, the day He created the heavens, the skies, and the earth, of which four are haram, haram sacred, holy. That is the complete perfect religion. So do not wrong yourselves in these months. How do you wrong yourself? When you disobey Allah, when you commit sin, when you do harm, when you remove the limits from yourself and become worse than an animal. Why shall you do that to yourself? Why? Why when Allah gave you a mind? Why when Allah gave you a soul? Why when Allah gave you a heart? Why when Allah made you a human? Why when Allah honored you, why do you seek this honor? Allah in Al-Quran Kareem said, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمٍ We have honored the children of Adam. وَحَمَلْنَا ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ We carried their descendants in the land and in the sea. وَلَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ We've given them from the graces وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِّمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا And we preferred them over a great portion of our creation. يعني you are of the top 1%. Allah said, I preferred you over a great portion of my creation. Which tells us there's other honorable creation of Allah. But we are from the top. And with us there are other on the top. Allahu a'lam who they are and where they are and where do they live. Allah is telling you, I have honored you. Why do you seek to run away from honor? Subhanallah. And that's why, brothers and sisters, these ashur al-hurum revive in us the meaning of halal and haram. Revive in us that we have limits. Revive in us responsibility. Revive in, in us the feeling of having limits, and with that, we become honorable human beings. Because the word forbidden in every language is associated with the word sacred and holy. So when Allah calls Al-Baytul Haram the forbidden house, what is Allah saying? The holy house, the sacred. Why sacred? Because people there are not there to harm themselves or harm others. They are here to benefit themselves and benefit others. If they see someone thirsty, they give them water. They see someone hungry, they give them food. They see an old person, they carry him. They see a person lost, they find him. They find where is his company. They see someone who needs help, they help one another. They're not allowed to hunt within the boundaries of haram. Because not even pigeons, not even deers or gazelles or any of this creation is supposed to feel fear in that secure place. Because when you have limits, there will be security, because nobody will kill nobody. Nobody will shoot nobody. Nobody will harm nobody, so the place will become secure. So Allah said, this is a secure place. Nothing should be harmed. Nothing should be killed for no reason. You are, and that's why, subhanAllah, it's all revolve around the same meaning. You go to Umrah, where are you going? To al Baytul Haram. <laughs> You're going to al Baytul Haram? Oh, yes. Oh, you need to do something. What is it? You need to wear Ihram. Oh, what does that mean? You need to wear the clothes that declare you in the state of Haram, state of Ihram. Meaning, listen, I'm not going to harm you. I'm not going to. I am in the state of Ihram. Again, back to the word Haram. The more haram you have, the more honorable you become. The more you say, I will not do this, I will, this is below the level, right? So a lot of time people come and ask, Sheikh, is this haram? Is that haram? Is this, okay, you know what? 
from Allah's mercy, He made what is haram in Islam very small items. Eat whatever you want. Just don't eat pork. And don't eat blood. Sheikh, who eats blood? No. Lots of people eat blood. They use the blood instead of the broth. I've seen that with my own eyes here in California. <coughs> Slaughter the cow, they put the bucket, and then it becomes like a gel. You know, it's... What is that called? Clotting. Yeah. Clotting, yes. The clots, so then they cut it, and then they put the clots in bags, in bags. I'm like, what, what do you do? Oh, we cook the meat with it. This is the broth. The hell? Wallahi, Allah said the truth. I thought I would never see in my life someone eating blood. I saw it in 2016. So Allah said, don't eat the blood, it will harm you. Don't eat pork, you know, went to the church, and someone asked, laughingly, you know, why, do, why, why what do you have against pork, guys? What do you have against pigs? I said, actually, we have nothing. What do you have against pigs? <laughs> we have nothing, that's why we don't eat them, we don't touch them. You guys keep on killing them and eating them. What do you have against pigs? <laughs> and they started laughing. We have nothing. We just leave them alone. If they don't harm us, we don't touch them. That's all. So Allah said, eat whatever. Just don't eat. don't eat something that eats meat. According to the analysis of scientists, this is on the radio, I heard it ten times, National Public Radio, National Geographic, this and that, science. They think the way AIDS developed, there was a monkey, monkey, that had a virus in it. No normal animal virus, no big deal. So another monkey, chimpanzees, hunted that monkey and ate it. The monkey that ate the other monkey had the virus in it, too, different than that virus. Rarely it happens, but it does happen, it happens, the two viruses married each other and became one virus, forming what? The HIV virus. Then what happened? Someone went and hunted that chimpanzee and ate it. And that's how the first case of HIV developed. Or, if you are a conspiracy theory, it developed in the labs of God knows who. Right? <laughs> Both possibilities. If you have the rule, I don't eat what eats meat, I don't eat carnivores, then you would have not had that problem. You understand how much it saves you. So if there's something that eats meat, I don't. Unless it's fish in the sea, then the rule doesn't apply. Because all fish eat other fish, there's no problem. Sheikh, can we eat shark? Yes, you can eat shark. There's no exclusion to sharks or whales or anything. As a matter of fact, in the hadith, one of the Sahaba ate from whales and brought from the liver of the whale to the Prophet ﷺ. Prophet looked at it and smiled. And he said, do you know what's the meat, the first meal of people who enter Jannah? They said, what you also like? He said, the liver of the whale. That's the first meal you eat in Jannah. Ziyada to kebid al The ziyada of kebid al hut. That says there is the kebid and there's a ziyada that comes out of it, like an extra part. That's your first meal in Jannah. What does it do to your body? Only Allah knows in Jannah. Like it gives you longevity or God knows what it does. So, brothers and sisters, we need to revive this haram. So, there's something called haram, but Allah made what is haram. Do you drink all the juice? Just don't drink alcohol. Don't let it ferment. So the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, we make juice. You know, because juice was only for rich people. What would it take to get the juice out of an apple without a machine? Imagine you have an apple, there's no machine to juice it. What would, do you know how to it? What do you do? You bite it and spit it out. Bite it and spit it out. <laughs> Good idea. What's the traditional way? How did they use to get it out? Huh? Put a rock on the heavy rock on the top of lots of apples, which is laid on another rock, and then whatever seeps from the side because it's very difficult. So, this is called nabiv. Nabiv is two kinds fresh nabiv, which is fresh juice, and nabiv that is fermented. So, they said, Ya Rasulullah, we make nabiv. Can we drink it? He said, Drink it as long as it did not stay overnight. Because in Arabia, overnight, one day, eight of Arabia will ferment anything. <laughs> So he said, drink it as long as it's fresh. And that's why, you know, our Christian brothers and sisters, they say, uh, what's the first miracle of Jesus in the Bible? First miracles of Jesus in the Quran before he was born. 
spoke to his mother from his from her womb after he was born delivered a speech first miracle for jesus is him turning at age 33 first miracle of jesus very late compared to the quran he has already done so many miracles and taking the clay blowing in it becomes a bird but for in the bible when he's 33 he turned water into wine you see wine is halal why do you call it halal no but he turned water into juice because the word wine is the same word in arabic nabiz because the poor people in their wildest dreams they could not drink to drink to eat the fruits in a form of juice so Sayyidina Isa turned the water because they're drinking water all day to juice what the rich people only drink to the masses so they enjoyed it uh, alcohol no, no that was not alcohol that was juice <laughs> so Allah Azza wa Jal built our whole team <coughs> on five things. They all have to do with forbidden things. These five things, if we observe them, we will live in the state of safety. What are the five things? Preserving your mind. That's why alcohol is forbidden. Number two, preserving your faith. That's why ruining people's faith without knowledge is forbidden. Number three, preserving your property wealth that's why stealing is forbidden number four preserving your honor that's why backbiting and adultery and fornication is forbidden because it destroys people's honors so preserving your faith preserving your mind preserving your property preserving your honor and what's the fifth one Huh? I didn't say it. We said property. mind, faith, property, honor. Who knows the first? These are the five hudud of Islam. Sheikh Abba. What's the mother of them all? Think of the capital punishment. Preserving life. <laughs> That's why killing another person. These five things trigger punitive law in Islam. Punishment law. These five things. Islam, in its big, 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 big picture, what is Allah trying to accomplish through Sharia? Preserving your mind, preserving your faith, preserving your life, preserving your property, preserving your honor. Touch any one of these things towards another person, you will get punished. Because now you overstepped. So what is Islam trying to create in the society? Safety. You as an individual apply these things on yourself and the society applies it on each other. So now we don't, we're not struggling with our kids on drugs or on alcohol. Or God forbid going the route of zina. You understand? Because the society protects each other. I watch your back, you watch my back. This is the purpose of the Islam. That's why Islam is to live in the state of safety, aspiring to peace. Because peace is not something you turn on and off. Halal and haram, you turn on and off. Right now, you can make a choice not to kill a person or to kill a person. Steal someone's iPhone or not to steal someone's iPhone. Right now, in one second. But to achieve peace, it's a life journey. It's a life journey. You have to do so many things. And when you are young, you're always stressed out easily. You grow older, you've seen so many things, so many things, so many things, and you're like, ah, you know, that doesn't stress me out anymore. So now you are more in the state of peace. Why? Because you've seen so much. Peace doesn't happen quickly. Safety happens like this. Snap. Right now, you can be safe, and everyone around you is safe, or you can be danger to yourself and everyone is in danger or because of you. So the first principle in Islam is halal and haram. To live in the state of safety. No haram, no safety. First thing in Islam, the five purposes of Sharia. Preserve intellect, preserve faith, preserve life, preserve property, preserve honor. This is the first. To preserve it, the people in that society have to believe that this is forbidden and I will not touch it. Now, if you believe that, then welcome to Al-Bayt al-Haram. 
If you believe in that, then welcome to wearing ihram. If you believe that, then there is four months that you even reinforce these meanings. What are the four months? The month of Ramadan, and the month of Rabi'i Awwal, and the bit wrong. The four months has nothing to do with Ramadan at all. Ramadan is a thing on its own. It's the seventh month, Rajab. Then, Dhul Qa'idah, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram. Three consecutive months. Right? Three consecutive months. Dhul Qa'idah, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram, and then Rajab. Out of these months, one month carried the word Muharram, which is the month of Muharram. The word Haram. That's why the Prophet said, this is the month of Allah. And he said, the best fasting after the month of Ramadan is the fasting of Shahrullah al Haram this month. <laughs> and the best prayers after the Fard prayers is the prayers of the night, Qiyam and Tahajjud. Not only in Ramadan, year around. The first, the best fasting after Ramadan is in Shahrullah al Haram. The best prayers after the fart is the one you do at night when everybody goes to sleep. Because now you are investing in a personal relationship between you and Allah. It's no more about you, people, and masjid and jama'ah. That's you did in the morning, five daily prayers, jama'ah, people. Now it's one-on-one -on -one time with Allah. So that's the best prayers. Another hadith in Musnad al-Imam Ahmad and at Tirmidhi, the Prophet وسلم, said, one of the, the best months is Shahrullah al Haram. Allah has forgiven some people in this month, and Allah will forgive more people in this month. What, what some people in this month? Allah forgave the children of Israel in this month. And Allah shall forgive more nations to come in this month, which is us. So, this is a month in which Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a track record of forgiveness in this month. So how do you start? Sahaba got together. We need a calendar. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari sent a letter to Sayyidina Umar Khattab. You send a letter for me, do this by Sha'ban. But you don't specify Sha'ban this year or the following year. Two people came and they have one borrowed money from the other. To Sayyidina Umar Khattab and he said, yeah, he borrowed from me, he didn't pay me back on time. He said, do you have a contract, written contract? They said, yes. So they got the written contract, they gave a statement. It said, and he shall pay me back this amount in Sha'ban. So Omar Khattab said, which Sha'ban is that? Last Sha'ban, the one who gave the money away. He said, yeah, it was last Sha'ban. The one who owes the money, he said, no, it's next Sha'ban. <laughs> the Sayyidina Omar said, we can't go on like that. What do we do? So they said, okay, we will make a calendar. Let's follow the Roman calendar. He said, the Roman calendar is not for us. It's solar calendar. Our months are lunar. People don't appreciate lunar months anymore because we're not in touch with nature and because we don't practice Iqra, Bismi Rabbika, Ladi Khala. But let, I will take all of your phones away, all of your Raznamas away, all of your calendars away, and I'm going to ask you tomorrow to walk outside in nature and tell me which day of the month it is. There's no way for you to tell. There's three, four months that are hot. Is it June, July, August? Sometimes September is hot. But even if you don't know which month it is, when you go out at night and watch the moon, you can tell which night. You know the Arabs? You know how they used to look the calendar? Do you know when was the calendar? In the sky. They walk out and they look. Oh, it's the 14th. Today and tonight, our eyes are not trained. Their eyes were so trained, they will know from the birth of the Hilal to the next day, next day they can tell you it's the 7th of the month, the 9th of the month, the 11th of the month, just by looking at the moon. Divine calendar. Take the moon out, just stay with the solar months, you have no way of knowing it. You go by the season. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us, the Prophet said, fast Ramadan for seeing the Hilal. Break your fast for seeing the hila. There's a touch between you and nature. You're in touch with nature. So our months are unique because they keep us in touch with nature. So in this, you know, they said, okay, 
which year shall be, so someone said, first year shall be the birth of the Prophet Other Sahaba said, when Rasulullah received the revelation, when he was 40, that should be the first year. Other Sahaba said, when he died, we all know which day he died. So, and they said, and then someone said, from the day of Hijrah. And once someone said that, every Sahaba said, wow, that's a nice day. So they said, okay, first year is the year of Hijrah. Okay. Year of Hijrah, Rasulullah was 53. He became a prophet at 40. 13 years in Mecca, 53. Moving to Medina, 10 years in Medina, 63. Then he passed away, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? Tayyip. So Rasulullah passed away in the 10th year of Hijrah. Tayyip. How long Abu Bakr was the Khalifa? Two years. Tayyip. So now we have 10 plus 2. When did the meeting take place? In the third year of the Khilafah of Umar al Khattab. So when they decided what year was the first year, it was already year 15. When they decided which year shall be, they decided what year it shall be. Year number one they were in year number 15 from the Hijrah. So what happened before? Do we go minus one Hijrah, minus two Hijrah? Minus? No, no, we don't go minus. We call min al bi'tha from the day the Prophet was declared as a Prophet. So from age 40, that's the first year of al bi'tha Second year of al bi'tha bi'tha means he was sent. Allah sent him to mankind by receiving iqra bismillah So we have min al bi'tha and we have min al hijrah Got it? So then we have to study these months, and then in this ayah that I read, next ayah in which Allah says, the number of months are 12 months, lunar months, of which there are four that are sacred. From the day that Allah created the heavens and the earth, these four are declared sacred. Month number 11, 12 and 1. These months are around the season of Hajj. Month number 11, some people who live away from Mecca, they start coming for Hajj, a month before. Then the month of the Hajj, and then they travel back another month. You understand? But then they discover that with camels and this, they can come from any corner from the Arabian Peninsula in two weeks. Hajj finishes on the 13th of Dhul Hijjah. So you still have two weeks to come back, right? There was a problem. The Arabian Peninsula was inhabited by tribes. And those tribes, like our day to day, they used to make a living from war. Something which is not new. War was a means of making a living. So they said, okay, the strong tribe attacked the weak tribe, destroy their whole, you know, take men, kill them, take women, concubines, take children, sell them as slaves. Take their positions, take their camels, take their cows, take their lambs, take their sheep, take their goats. Wow, that's a good thing. Raiding. They used to raid each other. So what did the Arab do? They did not fight in Dhul Qadda because everybody's traveling for Hajj. They're like, we're going to keep that. Dhul Hijjah, everybody's going home from Hajj. We're going to keep that. But Muharram, you yani three months without fighting. Well, not too much. <laughs> How are we going to make a living? So the Arab started doing something interesting. They said, this year will not be Muharram. This year, we're going to name Muharram Rabi' al-Awwal. Rabi' al-Awwal, we'll call it Muharram. This Muharram, we can fight. But when Rabi' al-Awwal comes, it will be a replacement for this. So what did Allah say in the ayah after this ayah? Inna man nasi'u ziyadatun fil kufr. Ziyada, janta hai? Ziyada matlab, huh? Kufr and ziyada in kufr. <laughs> yani not only you have, you are worshipping idols now, now you are playing with the deen of Ibrahim alayhi salam. You coming and declaring a month that Allah declared haram, you're calling it halal. Well, let's fight in each other and raid one another. Subhanallah. So Allah Azza wa Jal told us these four months, we're not supposed to oppress ourselves and we're not supposed to declare war. Interesting line. This deen gets accused to be it's a deen of terrorism when actually one third of the year, four months, you're not supposed to initiate an offensive act. Four months. One third of the year. 
And Allah said, do not oppress yourselves. How do you oppress yourself in this month? By committing haram. So brothers and sisters, the question is, coming year is upon us. What are your goals? As I said today in the khutbah, I think it will be posted very soon, inshallah. What are your goals for this coming year? What do you want to accomplish? If you can accomplish Islam, which is to live in a state of safety by abiding by the rules of Allah, the five purposes of Sharia, the halal and haram, aspiring to peace. How do you aspire to peace? Through your prayers, through your fasting, through your charity, through your self-cleansing from inside, through dhikr, you acquire peace, peace. By making an informed choice, how can you make an informed choice without learning your deen? How do you make an informed choice without learning your deen? This is very common. Every day I deal with this. A very strong brother in their deen, a very strong sister in her deen, very devoted, very disciplined. In the ibadah, they are 99%. <coughs> but in ilm, they are 1%. So while in this journey, Shaytan comes and puts a little rock in front of them. They tremble and fall and almost lose their deen. Every day story. Why? Because nobody's learning the deen. Nobody dedicated himself to spend maybe one month of the year learning the tricks of Shaytan. How does Shaytan mislead the, the son of Adam? The Quran is full of that and the Sunnah is full of that. How can you, how can you predict Shaytan? You know people that was very normal. People used to be able to predict shaitan and realize, oh, this is from the waswas of shaitan. And every time shaitan make waswas, khannas, to the believer, they used to remember Allah. Yani shaitan used to fail miserably in his mission. He comes to whisper to you, he ends up making you remembering Allah. Because you know his tricks. But if you don't have this education, how are you going to battle shaitan? How are you going to battle your nafs? That erupts, this is the way I am. We will never change our ways. We will never change our culture. We will never change our tradition. This is the way we are from thousands of years. You're giving a very nice speech about Jahiliya. MashaAllah. You're saying, this is amazing Jahiliya. Very nice. No, we will change our ways if it is against the way of Allah. Yes. Because we will be backwarded stone age, close-minded, narrow-minded by choosing our own cultures and traditions over the word of Allah and the messenger sallallahu his messenger sallallahu alayhi who want us to live a fresh life, <coughs> prosperous life, good life, not a life full of guilt. You know, the simple thing, shaitan double dips on a Muslim who's ignorant. First, you're doing well, you're doing ibadahs, Shaitan makes you go and do something, sin. Whatever the sin is. But obviously, you've never learned in details the story of Adam. So, you're like, oh my God, I was a good Muslim. I became, I, I broke my covenant of Allah. I made a sin. Oh my God. So first, Shaitan whispers, 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 and makes you do something haram. Because you couldn't catch his whisper the first time. You did it. Fine. No problem. Now, it's time to repent. After you feel guilty, feeling guilty when you do something wrong is a healthy sign that you have a living heart. After you feel guilty, alhamdulillah, that you felt guilty because some people do wrong and they don't feel guilty. Na'udhu billah, their heart is dead. So they feel guilty. When you feel guilty, Allah says, now time to move on. How do I move on? Follow a bad deed with a good deed and it shall erase it. Move on. Move on. How? You had energy to do something bad? Yes. Okay, you should have energy to do something good. Get up and do something good. Okay, and what happens if I do something good after I do something bad? Allah said, the good deed will erase the bad deed. Not my word. I'm not trying to become a philosopher or a very nice shi'ir who promises nice things to people. Two ayat in the Quran. Inna al-hasanati yudhibna sayyat. Good deeds erase bad deeds. Wa atbi'i sayyat al-hasanati tamhuha. Follow a bad deed with a good deed and it shall erase it. Two different ayat in the Quran. Do you know what we do? We just get stuck in feeling guilty. And oh my God, does Shaitan love that? Because he did two things to you. He made you go and do something haram, and then he paralyzed you from doing something good. 
So he double dipped on you. He made you do something wrong, and I'm like, oh, I'm a bad Muslim. I remember sitting down with the sister. I am a bad, what did you do? I did this. I said, okay. How do you feel? I feel bad, I feel guilty. I said, good, first healthy sign. Second, did you do it again? Astaghfirullah, Sheikh, I never did that again, ever in my life. Good, mashallah, second box, check. Do you intend to do it again? Yeah, Sheikh, I will never do this again. I said, for the third box, chop, check. Did you give charity and sadaqah? Did you make dua? Did you make extra salah? Yeah, Sheikh, I've been doing this for seven years. Good, check, box. I told her, okay, so, What's the problem? <laughs> oh, Allah will never forgive you. I said, okay, hold on, hold on. You speak in the name of Allah or Allah speaks in the name of Allah? I want to know. She said, no, Allah speaks in the name of Allah. I showed her two, three ayahs on the Quran. But Allah said, if you do one, two, three, four, I shall forgive you. So I'm telling her, you're accusing Allah of lying? Allah said, if you do one, two, three, I will forgive you. So I'm telling you, you're forgiven. Not because I'm granting you forgiveness, because I have belief in the word of Allah. So Allah said, if you do one, two, three, four, I will forgive you. And no questions asked. And Allah says, you can bring my word to me on the day of judgment and hold me to my own word. Like no problem, because I don't change my word. She said, oh my God. So Allah forgive me? I said, yes. You, I asked you specific questions. Did you lie in any of them? He said, no. I said, according to the ayah of the Quran that I just showed you, Allah has already forgiven you. Now, can you please move on? But no, I said, I did something wrong. I said, go. <laughs> go home and cry till the day you die. Because you are exactly following the traps of shaitan. He made you do the sin the first, and he's paralyzing you the second. What is this? Oh, but why? Our culture teaches us. How do you become a good Muslim? If you feel a lot of guilt. Oh, you are a good Muslim. You shall feel guilty 24-7. You shall feel dirt. You shall feel, you know, accused. You shall live in regret. Then you, who said that? Is your design or Allah and his message? Because Allah's message, I don't read any of this. Allah and his messenger said, if you do something good and you feel the guilt, Take that guilt and use it as a propeller, an engine to make you go and do something right and move on. Don't get stuck in guilt. But people want to do that. So, brothers and sisters, come in here, liberate yourself. Follow Allah's way. Don't follow your culture way. Unless your culture matches the word of Allah. Alhamdulillah. Islam does not have a problem with culture. Afghans wear hijab this way. Pakistanis wear hijab that way. Syrian ladies wear hijab that way. Saudi ladies, as long as you're wearing hijab, whatever colors you choose, that's your business. In Africa, Muslim women, they wear a turban, literally, like ulama. That's their hijab. And they wear a shirt, and that's their hijab. As long as it fulfills the hijab, alhamdulillah. Islam does not, it's not going to come and say, you can only wear black or brown or blue. Dark also. Not light blue, dark blue. Where do you come up with that? Where do you come up with that? We have hadith that women in Medina used to wear white. Where do you go with that? And ladies used to wear black also. So that was their available colors at that time. Cotton and God knows what else. So the idea here, Islam never asks people to change their the taste of their food. As long as you're not eating haram, you keep everything tasting the way it is. Just don't use haram ingredients. Islam does not fight the culture unless the culture starts fighting Islam and putting ways. So this coming year, we want to enjoy our deen. We want to live in the state of safety to aspire to peace. Because once you start harming yourself, there's nothing to talk about. You keep on taking drugs, taking drugs, taking drugs until you fry your brain cells. Now, someone is sitting down wanting to talk with you. You can't even understand because your brain cells have fried. They're already gone. So first principle in Islam, live in the state of safety. Eat from the garden, but don't eat from this tree. This will ruin your safety. Don't eat from the tree. And anything haram became the resemblance of that tree is anything haram. Now, once you do that, you have to make a choice. And I don't want to repeat the khutbah, but I'm going to leave you with a question 
that I ask myself and I ask people to answer in the khutbah. Why are you alive? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want from yourself? What do you want from your wealth? What do you want from your family? What do you want from your existence? What do you want? There's only two choices. People are on this planet to build a glory for themselves and leave a legacy. Or they are on this planet to build a glory for Allah and legacy for them. Even nations do that. We're going to show them who's boss. Okay. Meet you after a thousand years. You will not exist. It's not going to happen overnight. But look at the Roman Empire. Even when Muslims started thinking like that, their empire is gone. When a person thinks, I'm here to, I'm going to show them. Show who? People. What? I have wealth. You really don't want to do that. You're going to invite so many things against you. Unless you are very good in reading Qul Huwa Allah, Haqqul Allah, Quran Das three times and Ayat Al-Kursi every morning and every evening, you're going to bring so much pain, right? And people, when you show them who makes money, I'm going to show them. Show them what? How good looking I am. Okay. I'm going to show them how many children I have. I'm going to show and people live their life. This is how we live our life. We live our life living in the minds of others. So I wake up in the morning and I say, what am I going to wear? And then I start imagining the people in the street looking at me. And then I start, okay, they're going to look at me and they're going to judge me this way. So I want to wear that shirt and that pants so that when they're looking at me, hold on, can you get out of people's heads and get in your own head? So we live our lives thinking what people are thinking about us and we forget the most simple principle in Islam. What is Allah thinking of me? So, people want to build a legacy, build a legacy, build. People stop talking about Steve Jobs. Who's talking about Steve Jobs? Nobody. It's, it's over. It's now Coke. And Coke is going to be gone. It's in Coke. And then who's going to be gone? When was the last time you went to a funeral and people stood up on the top of the grave of a person and said, MashaAllah, he was an amazing person. He had 12 apartment buildings. They were all rented. <laughs> Allahi, this guy had a Ferrari, next to it Lamborghini, next to it Maserati, next to it, and then he had some BMWs and Mercedes parked outside. When was the last time you heard that? People who are like that, self-centered people hate them and they don't even show to their funeral. Because they were self-centered and they never cared about anyone else. But when do people come, where do people show in large amounts? When there is someone who used to give and give and give, whether it's knowledge or money. When they come, they said, SubhanAllah, he used to give. He was there for me when no one was there for me. But yet, what people want to do, they want to build a legacy for themselves instead of building. We are here for a short period of time to build a legacy and the glory of Allah. We do things for the sake of Allah and we make things for the sake of Allah. If you do that, Allah said, your glory and your legacy is on me. I shall take care of you. How? Oh, you can't even imagine how. What did you want in life? A house? I have gardens for you, houses. What did you want in life? Money? I have endless wealth. What did you want to be known? I have endless knowledge for you. You are here. If you build a legacy for me, I will build an eternal legacy for you. Khalidina fiha abada. Allah confirms the meaning in two words. They shall live in there forever, for eternity. As if the word forever is not enough. They shall live in there forever, for eternity. Double confirming the meaning. You build a legacy for Allah within 30, 40 years, Allah will build for you a legacy forever, for eternity. And subhanAllah, people love you. You love yourself. Allah loves you when you are not self-centered and selfish. When you are given, people hate you. You hate yourself and Allah will be displeased with you when you are self-centered and you're selfish. So anyway, you don't win when you go selfish. Not with people, not with yourself, not with Allah. So why do it? Why? Why live your whole life trying to get compliments from people and being selfish instead of helping them and being there at their time of need? 
That's why, brothers and sisters, have a goal. Say what Allah said to his messenger, Ibrahim, to what he said to his messenger, last messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah said, Qul, say, Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen la sharika lah wa bithalika umirtu wa ana awwal al-muslimin. Say, my prayers, my rituals, my life in its entirety, my death, it is all Lillahi Rabbil Alameen, to Allah. La sharika lah. No partners with him. I'm not going to build, I'm not on this planet to build a legacy for Allah and me. No, no, no. I'm here to build a legacy for Allah. La sharika lah. And with that, I have been commanded. Wa bidhalika umirtu. And I am the first of Muslimin. I don't want to be the last of Muslimin. I want to be the first of, wa ana awwalul Muslimin. That's your big goal in life. From that big goal comes out down. Okay, I need to live in a state of safety. No harm to myself or to others. From you done with that, you come now. Okay, not only I'm not gonna harm myself and others, that's not enough. I'm gonna benefit myself and others in the name of Allah. I'm gonna find a charity work, volunteering organization, come and help in the masjid, support a Muslimah, someone is in the street, host him. A lady completely broken and she needs some refuge, I will host her. A man who doesn't have money, I will help him. Because it's not enough not to harm yourself and others. You need to benefit yourself and others in the name of Allah for the sake of Allah. Now you have a plan. Then you ask yourself, how am I going to accomplish these goals? You put a plan and you go month after month after month. Waking up in the morning, what's my goal? قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَبَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَلَمِ لَا شَرِكَ لَهُ بِذَلِكُ مَتُوا وَنَا مُسْلِمِينَ What's my first priority? Don't inflict harm on yourself and others. What's my second priority? Bring benefit unto others, to yourself and to others. Why am I here? To build a legacy for Allah, not to myself. If Allah will decide to give me a legacy, He will give me a legacy. If Allah doesn't want me to give me a legacy in dunya, I'm sure He will give it to me in akhirah. And that's how you change yourself. Now you trickle down. Maybe you're not regular in your salah and namaz, you become regular in your salah. Maybe you're not regular in your fasting. Maybe you're not regular in giving charity, you become regular. Maybe you don't care about others and you're so selfish and self-centered that you only see your pain, you stop paying attention to the pain of the others. You start tailoring your own goals. But believe me, brothers and sisters, if you don't have that first goal defined, my life, my death, is for Allah, you will always be struggling with your faith. You will always say, Sheikh, I have weak Iman. No, no, you don't have weak Iman. You have weak knowledge, determination, and you avoid making a choice. So when someone tells you, are you here for Allah or for yourself? You're like, oh, I want a little bit for Allah. I want a little bit. No, no, no. When you give it for Allah, make sure, rest assured, Allah will give you back everything that you wanted. Everything that you wanted. When you are here for Allah, you're going to be get everything that you want. And then I'm saying, Ya Rasulullah, I make dua. Ya Allah, give me this. Ya Allah, give me that. Ya Allah, give me this. And then at the end, I say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala al Muhammad. So I do 10% of my dua for you. He said, is that good? He said, but if you want to do more, you can do more. He said, I do one-fourth of my dua for you. Like one-fourth of my dua will be just, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala al Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. He said, that's good, but if you want to do more, you can do more. He said, I'll make one half. He said, that's good, but if you want to do more, you can do more. He said, I will do two thirds. He said, that's good, but if you want to do more. The man said, Ya Rasulullah, I will make my whole dua for you. The Prophet smiled, and he said, then Allah will answer your dua. Allah will give you what you want. And Allah will save you from what you want to be saved from. Dedicate yourself to Allah, and Allah will take care of you. Dedicate yourself to yourself, and you cannot take care of even yourself. You're not going to help yourself. You just do your part and dedicate yourself to Allah, and Allah will take care of you. And that's my message to myself this year. My message to you, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. Inshallah, uh, make dua for me, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. May Allah Azza wa Jal. Heal all the sick amongst us, inshallah. And inshallah, I will be going through treatment, inshallah, for the next six months. And then I come back, inshallah, and do some good work, inshallah, with you. Inshallah, and continue. Jazakumullah khair. Barakallah feekum.
Make dua and may Allah Azza wa Jal heal us all from our sicknesses. Uh, the physical sickness is easy. There's a medicine for that. And when you when there is no medicine, <coughs> Allah rewards you for it. The spiritual sickness is not easy. When you make yourself intentionally, I'm saying intentionally, not unintentionally, intentionally, when you sicken yourself, you know what Allah said? In their hearts there is sickness. And Allah increased that sickness. Don't ruin yourself. My warning to you. Physical sickness, no problem. Too much reward, Allah will forgive your sins. Every time you go through a pain, Allah will forgive you. No problem. Physical sickness, all good news. Spiritual sickness, there's no shifa. Allah gives you more sickness. Don't ruin yourself. Know your limits. Don't become philosopher when Allah's word is between your hand and the messenger. You say, but I think this and I want this. And you mislead yourself and your family and the society because you're speaking from your head with no knowledge, experience, reference, nothing. Then you are in a great trouble in dunya and in akhirah. So that's why we say, Ya Allah, cleanse us from the diseases of the heart, cleanse us from the diseases of the soul from any sickness that is dangerous. And Ya Allah reward us for the sickness that we go through physically, inshaAllah Rabbil Alami. Amin Ya Allah. If there's any question, I would answer. If, yes, brother. So, uh, Sheikh, there's, I want to find out the significance of the uh, Rosa for the days of Muharram from you. Fasting the 10th of Muharram was a fasting that the Prophet وسلم, and the Sahaba practiced before fasting Ramadan. That's how old it is. <clears throat> Some say they used to fast, you know. Prophet came to Medina and said, Why do you fast this day? But the 10th of Muharram is a day of remembrance for it's like a world justice day. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, Allah saved him from Fir'aun. And on the 10th of Muharram, a sad incident took place in the history of this Ummah, which is the martyrdom of Sayyidina Hussein ibn Ali, radiallahu anhu wa Allah. Alihi wa ala abihi, radwanullahi ta'ala. So he was murdered on, this day, on that day. So this is a point of remembrance. Fasting the day of Arafah is a moment of reference and remembrance because what Sayyidina Hussein ibn Ali stood up for, he stood up for against injustice and stood up for justice. Sayyidina Hussein saw that the system Rasulullah left people with, which means Shura Abu Bakr, Shura Umar, Shura Uthman, Shura Ali, this Shura Al Hasan. Shura, people used to make elect. And suddenly that was gone, and now we have a king, son of a king, son of a king. So Sayyidina al Hussein stood up against the first king in Islam, which is Yazid ibn Muawiyah. And truly, as kings are known for, they are merciless. So it didn't matter that he was the grandson of Rasulullah, they slaughtered him. You understand? So this is. In 2017, when everyone's talking about justice, when everyone is talking about systems, Islam is for a system in which there is representation, and there is election, and there is nomination, and there is a choice. So that the people's voice is heard, but also the leader's voice are heard. Just like in England, it's not direct democracy. You elect a party, and the party that takes the majority in the parliament, they elect the prime minister of England. People don't elect the Prime Minister of England. Islam, more similar to that. You elect the Majlis al-Shura, and the Majlis al-Shura choose a Khalifa between them. So that's a modern even, you know, it's not far from reality. That is the system that Sayyidina Hussein said, I shall not live and die while I see that system change and nobody saying anything. I want to be the one who said something. And he said something, and he paid his life as price for it. Around age 33, 34, he passed away. And he had zero objections and zero regrets. 
his sister Zainab al Kubra, also the daughter of Sayyidina Ali, she came at him at his moment of death and he smiled and he said, Allah wait for me to die as a shaheed and Allah wait for you to be caught as prisoners of war. This is Allah's way and I'm at peace with it. I don't question Allah what he does, I question myself and I have stood up for the truth. So today, this is very relevant. Why? Because the Muslim world is ravaged by what? Kings, prime ministers, presidents that keep on sucking the blood of the nation and giving nothing back. We will not see the daylight as an ummah until we stand up for what Sayyidina Hussein stood up for. Which the Sahaba stood up for. Today, like when you talk about the Arab Bayt, it's Sunnah versus Shia. To me, I don't even remember the words Shia or Sunnah when I talk about Sayyidina Hussein. It's irrelevant. It's our deen, it's the Sahaba, and it's the grandson of Rasulullah. So we revolve around the love of Rasulullah and his Arab Bayt, as Allah taught us in the Quran. His messenger taught us in the hadith, and we do remember the death of Sayyidina al Hussein, but in a remembrance that honors his difference. But you know, to do rituals that dishonor Sayyidina al Hussein, I'm against that. Whether these rituals are done by Sunnah or Shia, I don't care. That's not the way you commemorate the death of al Hussein. You commemorate it with sitting down and having a discussion. How can we make this Ummah a better Ummah? When the Japanese are having a system to elect their leader, they have peace in Japan. It's proven when you have a system, a systematic way in which the voices of the people is heard, you have peace because everyone has part of that. So the Japanese get to have election, right? And someone wins the election. The Europeans get to have elections and someone wins elections. And we are part of a nation that we vote and someone wins the election. And then you have to respect someone won the election, except in the Muslim world. The nation goes to voting, and the leader goes to voting, and the leader wins against the nation. His one vote overrides all of their votes. Very interesting. And then we ended up breeding dictatorship. And then we ask what's wrong with Muslims. That's what's wrong with Muslims. At least one of the things that are wrong with Muslims is no, you know, it's constantly dictatorship. We celebrated the Arab revolutions and this and that, and it's like someone needed to teach us a lesson. Okay, you want freedom? I'll show you what freedom is. You'll all be dead. We shall not give in to that. We shall always be uh, vigilant so that we don't change the deen of Allah, we don't change what is right, we don't change justice. So the month of Muharram and the day of Ashura, fasting the day of Ashura has nothing to do with the death of Sayyidina Hussein. has nothing to do with it. Fasting the day of Ashura is fasting the day of Ashura, following the Sunnah of the Prophet. When the Prophet fasted Ashura, there was no did, or Al Hussein did, or Ali did, None of Al Bayt was dead except, you know, whoever died by them, Sayyidina Hamza, etc., etc. So it has nothing to do, just to make clear the distinction. But whatever historical events happened in Ashura, whether saving Musa alayhi salam, what did Musa? Musa told to Pharaoh, Ya Pharaoh, believe. Pharaoh said, I don't want to believe. I believe that I am God. As a matter of fact, I'm not just a God, I'm the greatest God. Because I don't like God, because then people will say there's a higher God than you. I don't like some higher God. Ana rabbukum al-a'la. I am your greatest Lord, greatest God. He said, okay. You don't want to believe? Don't believe. Can you just send with me the children of Israel so that we can go and leave you alone? We don't want to bother you. You want to take my slaves away from me? You're going to disturb my system of ruling? You're going to take my workers? Are you, are you crazy? What do you, what do you think? I'm not thinking anything. I just want to take my people and go away and leave you in peace. You don't want to believe, you don't want to change, that's your choice. But my nation, just give me one. Just send with me. Oh no. So nine ayat Allah showed Fir'aun, the frogs, the blood, the lice, the debris. Nine ayat Allah showed, and he wouldn't. He wouldn't release. Finally, Allah gave Musa and his people a way to leave, cross the sea. Musa followed. It's a celebration, it's a day of justice. The oppressed people won. The slaves won. And it was Allah who gave them that victory. They had no means of fighting for our and his army. 
So this is it's very interesting. Yani Allah saves Musa, right? And the weak people against the tyrant. And then also Sayyidina al Hussein stands up against a tyrant at that time. Cold blooded, like no no problem, anything goes. So it's the somewhat same message. But that has nothing to do with fasting the day of Ashura. We fast the day of Ashura because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fasted it. Before he met the Jews and after he met the Jews. He fasted it. That day and the day of Arafah. Alhamdulillah. So, very interesting. Ramadan, last 10 nights. Laylatul Qadr. Dhul Hijjah, first 10 nights. Arafah. Muharram, first 10 days and nights, and the day of Ashura. But the whole month of Muharram is also open for fasting and charity. So, in other words, we start the year on a high note. Fasting, charity, standing up for justice, helping the weak, no matter who they are. We start the year on that note, and then we finish the year with that, inshaAllah. Jazakumullah khair. Any other question? Yes. You don't need to stand up, you can sit down, Jazakumullah khair, Barak, Barak, Barak. Barak, Barak. Yes, there are Muslim countries that are inhabited by a lot of Muslims, but Islam is not applied anywhere. Yes. Thank you, Zakhir. No. Okay, I don't want to hold you hostage and hold you, you know, <laughs> because pretty soon we're going to start making Qiyam leg if you stay here, you know. <laughs> and we have Suhoor and Iftar and we never go home after that. Yes, young man. Everything I've explained in the lecture, from top to bottom, your goal is Allah, observe halal and haram, benefit others, establish the deen by helping others in the name of Allah, observe your own personal deen, salah, siyam. This is all being a khalifa. And we are khalifa to Allah fil ard. Not anywhere else. Allah said, inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. On earth, I will make a khalifa. So, this is our planet, this is where we belong. God knows, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran said, Allah created seven skies and seven earths. And the revelation is sent between these earths. So, another ayah Allah said, if I want, I will let those the creation of the heavens and the earth meet each other. So, one of the honorable people in Allah's creation is us human beings. But Allah speaks of other creation on other planets that also receive revelation. Just to give you a spin, right? Walk home thinking about aliens, right? <laughs> we are one of the aliens. There's another six aliens beside us. That's of what we know. And then there are other aliens that we don't know. So far we know of three aliens, us number one. Number two, angels. Because they're not DNA or carbon based. They are light based. And number three are a gem, they're not carbon-based or DNA-based. They are smoke-based. So go chase the smoke. So people say, what is the definition of aliens? Let's go and find them in other planets. We say, what's the definition? They cannot be carbon-based, not DNA-based. We say, oh, we're already ahead of you. We know two people, we talk to them too. Angels and gem. When you're done finding them, come back to us. We'll tell you about number three. <laughs> like that. So, alhamdulillah, you know, our Quran is very interesting. Very, very interesting. Indulge yourself in the book of Allah. Show Allah that, Ya Allah, I want to live by your book. Show Allah that and Allah will help you. Read, read the Quran. Don't, don't be intimidated. Don't let people tell you, you need to read 5,000 books before you read the book of Allah. 
There's no such an ayah in the Quran. As a matter of fact, in one surah, four times Allah said, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلْذِكْرِ فَهِمُّ We've eased Quran for dhikr, so is there anyone who wants to make dhikr? Yani Allah made it easy. I also was given an amana. I'm glad I remembered. I see the sister in the corner of the room. Um, so there's an MSA in the local high school, and there's a lot of Muslims in that uh, high school. And our sister here, her daughter, was speeding, uh, you know, an effort to get these Muslim students to make a club, do activities, anything, archery, swimming, basketball, nothing heavy or religious, no heavy load. But the kids are not showing. They're not showing. They're maybe afraid, maybe they're shy, maybe they are running away from their Muslim identity. Whether the registered one or non-registered one, they're not showing. So if you have a kid that goes to high school, ask them to show up. Let's support our local MSA. I have witnessed with my own eyes within the last 10 years, you know, almost 15 years or 20 years, the birth, rise and demise of MSAs because of the culture, public culture. You know, so Muslim students don't want to show that they're Muslims or this or that. Even though they get credit for it when they apply for universities, I was of the Muslim Students Club, you get a credit for that, right? So, let's figure a way to make our Muslim students proud that they're Muslims. Maybe they're not going to come back to Islam by telling them, pray five times a day, maybe they're not going to come back. Maybe first step, you tell them, be proud that you're a Muslim because of one, two, three, four, because of our history, our science, our goodness, our people, maybe first you can attract them to the idea, to the identity, and from the identity you take them to the faith itself. But at least there's no hope in bringing someone back to the religion of Islam if they are even embarrassed of being a Muslim. We have now another problem to cover, which is the identity issue. Let's give them a Muslim identity, so from there they come back to Islam. But if I don't want to even be known as a Muslim, forget the five daily prayers. We're far away from that, you know. So inshallah, yani, we figure out a way to give accommodation, to give support, to give this. Um, I have just been to uh, Hub 925, which is a health club right here, that is meant for Muslims and non-Muslims, but it's given to, meant to give a space for our youth so that they are proud of who they are. Let's take our Muslim students in college, community college and high school, take them to help 9, 925, right? 925 is the area code of Pleasanton. So this is, you know, nice place. So maybe this is a, a zone that is less intimidating than the masjid zone, right? So they go there and this and that, and slowly but surely in this, then they come back to Islam. I was, I grew up in a religious family. No choices, like you had to follow this and that. But I fell in love with Islam. I am who I am today because of soccer. Believe it or not. I wish I can give you a glorious story. I was walking and Sheikh appeared to me and put his hand on my head and then I became a Sheikh. Believe it or not, none of that. We moved to a neighborhood there was the youth of the masjid, they used to go to school, come back, have lunch, do their homework, pray asr, come out, play soccer till maghrib. Run to the masjid, pray maghrib, read Quran with a very beautiful, nice sheikh from maghrib to isha, pray isha and go home. And we did that six days a week. After one year, I discovered the biggest discovery in my life because I was a young adult. As an individual, independent, my own thoughts, heart, so, my own choice, I discovered that I actually love Islam. I love everything about it. I love what it does to people. I saw my friends and what Islam did to them. It made them more dear to me than my flesh brothers. We were young, clueless, but we were ready to die for one another. That's how much we loved one another. So, I fell in love with Islam. Why? Because someone invited me to a soccer game. And all of my family legacy that I can tell you about between now and tomorrow, Salat al-Fajr, didn't matter. That's not what made me choose Islam. And say, I want to live the rest of my life doing what that Sheikh did to me. There's 10 of us that we were in that halaq. All of us turned full-time, like, dedicated people. Serving Allah Azza wa 
The love he planted in our hearts for the deen of Allah is unimaginable. So my mission in life was not to become imam or sheikh or speaker. I could care about any of that. Give me 10 youth and I am very happy in my own universe. Doesn't matter what happens after that. So to take our students to basketball game, you know, back home soccer, here basketball, does miracles, miracles, really. It graduates imams and mashayikh. You know? Then after they want that, we can send them to the Islamic school, and after that we send them to Zaytuna, and after that we send them, you know. But we first have to find a way. So let's make it our goal next year, find Muslim youth, send them to Hub 925. And then from there, maybe we can secretly smuggle them to MCC, right? InshaAllah, <laughs> that would be a nice goal. InshaAllah. ربنا أتينا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا أنت من نار يا الله we ask you by your grace and by your forgiveness and by your love by you being الودود الرحمن الرحيم يا الله you will forgive all of the sins we committed last year and the years before يا رب العالمين يا الله make this coming year better than the last year يا رب العالمين يا الله change us from inside out put your light in our hearts Enlighten our souls, awaken us, make us awake, aware, and alert. Ya Allah, make us fall in love with you, with your messenger, with your book, with your deen. Make us make a choice that we want you, and we desire you, and we want to give you everything that you've given us. Ya Allah, make that spark go inside our hearts. For us, for our sons, for our daughters, for our spouses, for our relatives and friends and loved ones, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, that spark that you put in the heart, that hidayah, that nur, that salam that you put in the heart, no one can put it in our hearts but you, Ya Allah. So we ask you and no one else for that, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you that you choose us, you choose us, and you, we ask you to help us to choose you. Remove our ignorance, remove our veil, remove the shaitan, the nafs, the temptation of life, what we want and we don't want. Remove it from us and make us see you as our ultimate goal in this life, Ya Rabbi al -Alamin. Ya Allah, we ask you that you guide us to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Keep away the temptations of dunya, whisperings of shaitan, desires of the nafs, company of bad friends, keep it away from us and make us walk on a sirat al-mustaqeen. Make the Qur'an our bin Hajj. Make the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa our example and role model. Inspire us to learn it, believe it, practice it, call for it, dedicate our lives for it, Ya Rabbi al -Alami. Ya Allah, we know that you are capable of giving any honor to anyone. So we ask you to give us the maximum honor for us to reach the maximum potential of our lives, to live life to the fullest in your name for your sake, Ya Rabbi Alameen. Ya Allah, we ask you that you help us against all the struggles that we face in our lives. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in, Ya Rabbi Alameen. So help us, Ya Allah. Help us with any challenge that we find in financially, with our health, with our families. Help us so that we are all walking on your path and doing what we're supposed to do on this planet for this short of time that you've given us for our lives, Ya Rabbi Alameen. Ya Allah, bless this community specifically, this town, this masjid, and bless our community all over the United States, all over America, all over the world, Ya Rabbi Alameen. Make us people who bring hope, bring knowledge, bring honor to Muslims around the world, Ya Rabbi Alameen, and make us a beacon of light that will you know, guide others to you, Ya Allah, not to us, Ya Rabbi Alameen. Ya Arham Ar-Rahimeen. Subhanahu wa rabbika rabbil izzati wa ma yasifuna wa salamu ala ala mursaleena wa alhamdulillah ya Rabbi Alameen. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ala Muhammad kama salli ta'ala ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim. Wa barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ala Muhammad kama barik ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim. Fi al-alameen inna ka hamid al-majid. So the Sheikh just made a beautiful dua for our community, uh, but we would like to thank the Sheikh for, uh, uh, since MCC's inception around 2011, he's 
2007. He's just done so much for this community in, in the fundraising he's done with us, the advice, the <coughs> outreach that he's with us, uh, um, and the dwas that he's made for this community. So we can't thank you enough for all that you've done with us as a community, with your help and your dwa. Uh, you're one of the key contributors to MCC. So uh, we just like to make a quick call for you, inshallah. If we raise our hands, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Sabi be pleased with you and your family. And your family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you and your family the best of iman, health, I mean, grant you multiple openings and increase your tarja. Grant you a long, lasting, healthy, prosperous life, successful, inshallah. Protect you from all the evils. Grant you the best of both worlds. Grant you the company of our Habib. It's awesome. Make your life successful in this and the year after, inshallah. I mean, tomorrow, I mean. And I'm a chief father, I'm